Many racing drivers have had success in multiple categories of motorsport. The most recent example of a driver doing well in several series is Fernando Alonso, who has won the F1 Drivers' Championship as well as the Le Mans 24-hour race twice. Other examples in the 21st century include Juan Pablo Montoya, who has won races or championships in F1, NASCAR and IndyCar, and Nico Hülkenberg, who although hasn't won anything in F1, has had a long career and gained a reputation for being a midfield stalwart and did find success at Le Mans in 2015. However close each of these three got to achieving Motorsport's Triple Crown, with Alonso probably coming the closest, none have managed to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the Indianapolis 500 and the F1 Drivers' Championship or the Monaco Grand Prix. Another driver who got close in the last 30 years is Jacques Villeneuve, who won the Indy 500 in 1995 and the F1 Championship in 1997, but hasn't yet won Le Mans, despite coming second in 2008. Recent examples of Triple Crown attempts are rare, however that's not always been the case. Back in the 50s through to about the mid-70s, it wasn't uncommon to see F1 drivers compete in several series. Jim Clark and Jackie Stewart in particular were known for driving in upwards of 60 races a year. However, another driver who was an icon of that era has gone under the radar ever since. He had the record for the longest career in F1 history for several decades too, but he wasn't just a Formula 1 guy. Let me tell you the story of the only driver in history to win Motorsport's Triple Crown. Jim Clark drives the Formula One Lotus Sport to victory on the racetracks of the world. And look at that! Out that and colossally, that's Mansell! That is Nigel Mansell! Callum Frost has taken the advantage! Senna is trying to go through on the inside, and it's happened immediately! This is amazing! Senna goes off at the first corner! And I've got to stop because I've got a lot in my Norman Graham Hill was born on the 15th of February 1929 in Hampstead in London, England. He attended a Hendon Technical College and then once he got out of school, he became an apprentice engineer. Despite breaking his hip in a motorcycle accident, he then joined the Royal Navy and worked on the engines on HMS Swiftshaw and rose to become the rank of a petty officer. Was he complaining about his co-workers or something? After a stint in the Navy, he went back to being an engineer. Hill didn't pass his driving test until he was 24 years old, and he later described his first car as a wreck. He also said this was a good thing, as having a crap car teaches a budding racing driver delicacy, poise, and anticipation. He had a casual interest in racing, but that thirst was quenched in 1954 when he saw an advert at Brands Hatch allowing people to drive laps of a circuit for five shillings apiece. He also had a sporting interest in rowing and motorcycle racing, but cars soon overtook both of those pastimes, even though he adorned his helmet with the colours of a London rowing club, which he was a part of. He became a mechanic for Formula 3 champion Don Parker in return for a few race appearances here and there. Hill made his racing debut in a Cooper 500 car, then met Colin Chapman in 1954 and soon joined Team Lotus, where he began as a mechanic but eventually became a driver. He then drove on the club scene in 1956 in a Lotus 11 and won races at Brands Hatch and Silverstone and continued in 1957 driving cars run by a man named E.G. Manton. Hill made his Formula 1 debut at the second round of the 1958 season in Monaco, qualifying 15th and behind fellow Lotus debutante Cliff Allison. However, Graham made his way up the field impressively and was running in 4th place until his half shaft failed on lap 69. Nice. He qualified 13th in Zandvoort, but again retired, this time on lap 60 with overheating. He failed to finish all of the next four races at Rheim, Silverstone, the Nürburgring Nordschleife and Oporto, with the best qualifying of 12th, then took his first race finish at the 10th race in Monza in 6th, eight laps down on race winner Tony Brooks. At the last event of the year in Morocco, Hill finished 16th and embarrassingly behind four Formula 2 spec cars. Although his rookie season was attritional, he had shown glimpses of potential. He also competed in the 24 Hours of Le Mans, although the car retired after one hour with mechanical problems in the hands of other driver, Allison, and he also did one round of the British Saloon Car Championship at Brands Hatch. He remained with Team Lotus for 1959, however it was another sub-par season on the results front as he only finished two of the seven races he entered. 
His best result was 7th in Zandvoort, but he had been running in 5th when smoke began filling his cockpit, forcing him to pit and fix the issue. The fact his teammate Inas Island scored Lotus's first points in F1 in 4th after running behind Graham for most of the race must have been frustrating for the Englishman. Fed up with failing to score any points in two seasons, Hill joined the BRM team for 1960, an outfit I need to cover at some point in another video. His new employers had just come off the back of winning their first race in the hands of the Swede Joe Bonnier in the Netherlands the year prior. Graham's engineering background was held in high regard by the team as they looked to develop the new P48 chassis, however Hill impressed at the season opener in Argentina when he qualified third, which was on the front row in those days. He retired on lap 37 when his car overheated, then was classified 7th at Monaco despite spinning off on lap 66. Then at the Dutch Grand Prix, Hill finished 3rd and took his first career podium and points behind the Cooper of Jack Brabham and the second place Lotus of Ina's Island. Then at the Belgian Grand Prix, he was running 3rd again when he pulled into the pits going on to the final lap with engine issues. However, despite the fact he'd done 35 of the 36 laps of a Spa circuit in a race that had tragically claimed the lives of Chris Bristow and Alan Stacey, he was not classified and thus was listed as a retirement, even behind a series of cars that were up to eight laps down at race end. The rule on race classification had been applied inconsistently as American Harry Shell had once been classified during a race in 1959 despite retiring with 11 laps remaining. After his robbed podium, Hill qualified third in Rheim, but had an accident on the first lap which caused him to retire. Next came the British Grand Prix at Silverstone, and Graham qualified in second place, and led a portion of the race from laps 55 to 71, and set the race's fastest lap on lap 56 for good measure. However, with five laps remaining, after suffering from brake issues, he spun at cops and stalled, handing the win to Jack Brabham. He took his fourth retirement on the bounce in Portugal before BRM missed the infamous Italian Grand Prix held on the Monza combined layout on safety grounds. The season ending race at Riverside ended in another retirement for Hill as his gearbox failed on lap 34. He'd scored his first points and his first podium in Zandvoort but only finished two races all season, just like he had done in 1958 and 59. BRM along with the other British teams, were unprepared for the switch to 1.5 litre engine regulations for 1961, and thus Hill struggled. He took 6th at Rheim and 5th at Watkins Glen, despite the fact he had to pit to reattach his magneto in the latter. His team had teething problems getting their V8 engine working, but they hoped those problems would be fixed by 1962. Hill won two non-championship races in Goodwood and Silverstone before the season began at Zandvoort on the weekend of May the 20th. He was pipped to pole position by John Surtees' Lola by 0.1 seconds and although Jim Clark led the opening 11 laps, when the Scot had trouble in the pit, it was Graham who took over from there. He took his first win and his second F1 podium of a circuit he took his first rostrum at two years prior. Then at Monaco, Hill led from lap 7 until lap 92 of 100 when his engine gave up and robbed him of a certain victory. Despite not crossing the finish line under his own steam, he was classified in 6th. So yeah, those rules were applied inconsistently back in the day. He bounced back in Spa, taking pole by 1.8 seconds from Bruce McLaren's Cooper. Then, Hill led the opening lap, but was overtaken by Trevor Taylor, Willie Mariesi, and Jim Clark. Clark led from lap 9 onwards, and Hill was running fourth until Taylor and Mariesi collided fighting for second, allowing Graham to finish runners-up to the aforementioned Scott. He was leading and had set the fastest lap in Rheim, but then lost several laps and finished ninth after throttle linkage and fuel injection problems. Hill had to settle for fourth place in Aintree, as his BRM wasn't suited to the circuit like the other British cars were. However, he bounced back on the Nürburgring Nordschleife, qualifying second before winning with fastest lap on race day, which consolidated his driver's championship lead. Then in Monza, he got about as close to a Grand Slam as you can possibly get without actually getting one because after qualifying second, only three hundredths away from Jim Clark, he led all 86 laps and won by half a minute from Richie Ginther. This put him 14 points clear of second place Bruce McLaren and the standings and meant that he could guarantee his world title with a round spare in Watkins Glen if he won. However, after Clark took pole and led from the off, only losing it to Hill for six laps when the Scot was held up behind back markers, the Lotus won by 9 seconds which closed the gap to 9 points in the championship. If Clark won, regardless of Hill's results, he'd win the title on countback due to having more wins. 
However, the Scot retired from the lead with 20 laps to go with an oil leak, handing Hill the title, and he'd win to emphasise his achievement. The perennially bad performing BRM team had finally won something, not just the Drivers' Championship, but the Constructors too. Both Hill and Clark had suffered from reliability issues, the Lotus driver more so, but that's just racing. Then in 1963, the reliability of the two flipped around, as while Clark had only one race-ending mechanical failure, Hill had four. The Scott won seven races on his way to a perfect season points-wise, thanks to drop scores. Nonetheless, Hill won the season opener in Monaco and the United States Grand Prix at Watkins Glen, the latter of which from pole position. He also took pole in Spa, but that race was one of his retirements. He took three third places, although the one he got in Rheim didn't award him any points as he got a push start. Nonetheless, he finished second in the standings behind Clark and level on points with Richie Ginther, although ahead on countback. He also finished third in the British Saloon Car Championship behind Jack Sears and John Whitmore. He kicked off his 1964 season with a second win in the Principality, but only ran to fourth place at round two in Zandvoort. He rebounded in Spa by qualifying second and was leading with one lap to go when his fuel pump broke, meaning he eventually fell to fifth. Jim Clark moved clear of him in the standings, but Hill's three consecutive runners-up finishes at Rouen, Brands Hatch and the Nürburgring Nordschleife put the Englishman in front by two points going into the final four rounds. Both Hill and Clark retired in Zeltweg and Monza, so the status quo stayed the same, and it brought John Surtees to within four points of the championship lead with two races left. At Watkins Glen, Clark had qualified on pole but retired with fuel injection issues, which left Hill to win with Surtees second. Hill remained the leader on 39 points ahead of his fellow Englishman on 34 going into the last race in Mexico. Clark could still win on 30 points if Surtees were to finish third or lower and Hill was fourth or lower. Graham needed to win to outright guarantee the title, but under certain circumstances only needed the top three. Clark led from the off with Dan Gurney's Brabham second. Hill was third, followed by Surtees teammate Lorenzo Bandini, with Surtees himself in fifth. However, the battle was flipped on its head when Bandini ran into the back of the BRM in front of him, causing Hill to spin into the arm cow, suffer from exhaust damage and lose several places. Graham was now down on power and ran outside the points positions for the rest of the race. Now, the fact it was Surtees' teammate who crashed into Hill is either a convenient coincidence or Bandini did it on purpose. I understand the implications it may have that I'm a British person talking about a situation that is to the detriment of my compatriot, so I'll aim to be balanced here by saying there are rumours that Bandini took out Hill on purpose to help his teammate. However, there are no official sources or reactions or penalties for this, so it may have been a rumour made up by the ever-respectful and friendly British media. Nonetheless, with Hill out of the race for the title, Clark was leading on course to win his second consecutive crown, but on the second to last lap, an oil line failed just as he was about to start the final tour. The order was now Gurney, then Bandini and Surtees, however the Ferrari team realised that if they switched their two drivers around, then Surtees would be champion. They signalled frantically to their Italian driver to let his teammate through, and he obliged, which handed the 1964 championship to Surtees. He became the first driver to win world titles on both two and four wheels, a feat that hasn't been matched since, and most likely never will be. Curiously, due to the drop scores rule in place up until the early 90s, Hill had to give up the fifth place he scored in Spa, but had drop scores not been in effect, he'd have beaten Surtees to the crown by one point. Obviously everyone knew about this rule, and thus it doesn't mean Surtees wasn't a worthy champion, it's just another quirk of F1 points and F1 history. As well as finishing second in the Formula 1 standings, he also finished the Le Mans 24-hour race for the first time and came second with co-driver Joe Bonnier. His luck in France had also allowed him to win the Rheim 12 hours and the Paris 1000 km races. 1965 was a much less competitive year as Jim Clark won six of the nine races, including taking three Grand Slams in South Africa, Sherard and at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. The only crumb of comfort for Hill was taking his third win in Monaco and a near Grand Slam in Watkins Glen. His ruthless consistency meant that not only did he take second in the standings behind the runaway leader who had a 100% points tally again, but he also had to drop 7 points from his total at the end of the season because alongside his 6 podiums that counted to his total, he got 2 fifth places and a 4th place which didn't count at the end of the year. 
He had been bridesmaid three times now, however 1966 would show a downturn, at least on the F1 front. He failed to win the Monaco Grand Prix for the fourth time in a row, and only took two further podiums in Brands Hatch and Zandvoort. It was his first winless season since 1961. Well, I should clarify that actually. It was his first winless season in Formula 1 since 1961. That's because another opportunity came up in a different series. American Walt Hansgen had been preparing to drive a Lola T90 Ford in the Indianapolis 500, the fastest race on earth, but was killed in a test at Le Mans a month and a half before the race at the Brickyard. Thus, despite no experience driving on ovals apart from a failed attempt at the same race in 1963, off the back of Jim Clark's success in 1965, Hill was drafted in to drive for John Meckham's team. He started on the outside fifth row and managed not to get caught up in the melee on the opening lap. Eleven cars didn't make it past that first tour and Hill soon moved into second place behind fellow rookie Jackie Stewart. However, the Scots lost oil pressure after leading the first 190 laps and thus had to retire in the pits. Hill assumed the lead and became the first rookie winner of the Indy 500 since 1927 and the last until Juan Pablo Montoya did so in the year 2000. He'd also beaten Clark, who uncharacteristically spun twice during the race. He used the winnings from the Great American Race to buy a light aircraft as he'd recently learned how to fly. After a winless 1966 in Formula 1, he left BRM after seven seasons to rejoin Lotus, now having a direct comparison to team leader Jim Clark. However, he endured another winless year, this time more due to bad luck than unimpressive machinery. He struggled at the season opener in Kailami and only qualified 15th, before having an accident on lap 6. Then at Monaco, he finished 2nd after capitalising on Lorenzo Bandini's fatal accident at the seafront chicane. However, Hill couldn't catch a break for the rest of the year. He took pole and led early on in Zandvoort until his engine blew up, then at Spa, retired on lap 3 with clutch failure. He was on pole again at the French Grand Prix on the Le Mans Bugatti circuit and interchanged the lead until his differential went on lap 13. At Silverstone, he led a good chunk of the race before losing the lead to Clark and retiring again, this time with engine failure. He had suspension failure on the Nordschleife, then scored his first points and first finish since Monaco at Mossport. He was leading at the next race in Monza, when you guessed it, his engine went. Then at Watkins Glen, despite persistent gearbox issues, Hill finished second from pole position, also getting fastest lap. Hill led a few laps at the start of a Mexican Grand Prix that ended the season, but suffered another retirement due to half-shaft failure. 1967 was an embarrassing affair for Hill, as he lost up to five potential wins due to mechanical issues, and just like Clark, who had problems less frequently, could have won the title. Combined with his lack of results elsewhere, it was the least competitive he'd been in a while. However, going into 1968, the season looked promising for Team Lotus. Clark and Hill took 1-2 in both qualifying and the race at the opening round in Kyle Army, and it looked like it would be a close title fight between the pair from there on in, like it had been many times already. However, that was thrown into jeopardy when Clark was killed at a Formula 2 event at Hockenheim before the second race of the F1 season. His other teammate, Mike Spence, was also killed in the break between races, but it took great courage and determination to rally the team around the deaths of his colleagues, something his son Damon would do just over 25 years later in similar circumstances. Hill won in Spain and again in Monaco for the first time since 1965, which picked up the spirits of his team. He took an early championship lead but failed to score in any of the next four rounds in Spa, Zandvoort, Rouen and Brands Hatch, the latter of which he was leading when he suffered a mechanical failure. However, he remained in the lead in the title chase throughout this rough patch. He finished second in the race on the Nürburgring Nordschleife, while Jackie Stewart won by four minutes in the pouring rain, then retired again at Monza which brought second place Jackie Ix to within three points of Hill. After fourth place in Montremblant, he was level on 33 points with reigning champion Denny Holm. The Brit would have to clutch some good results in the last two races to win this title. Luckily, next up was a track he'd always historically been good at, Watkins Glen. He was second with Stewart first, and with Holm out, it meant Hill had to hope for at least second in Mexico with Stewart to struggle to win the crown. Stewart exchanged the lead with his rival early on, but eventually fell back, and Holm, who had been an outside shot for the title, retired on lap 10. Thus, Graham didn't need any result really, but nonetheless won by 80 seconds, 
from Bruce McLaren in second place. Yes, that's right, not eight, 80. Hill had picked up the Lotus team off the ground after the death of its greatest ever driver of the past, present or future and brought them both a Drivers' and Constructors' Championship. On pure results, it wasn't the most dominant or most underdog performance in history, but it was special for those other reasons. Hill was the number one driver at his team, but going into 1969, he was turning 40 years old, only really younger than three-time champion Jack Brabham, who was 43. I say only really because there were a couple of other drivers who did sporadic attempts at races, but they were in their late 40s, but Hill and Brabham, along with a couple of others, were really the elder statesmen of the grid. Being the age he was, though, wasn't as much of a death sentence as it is nowadays in F1, but it was something to bear in mind. If he was supposedly past it, he didn't show it as he finished runner-up in Kyle Army for the season opener. Then at Monhuic Park for the second round, Hill's experimental aerofoil rear wing failed during the race, causing a massive crash on lap 8. The same thing happened to his teammate Jochen Rint only 11 laps later. Then, he won at Monaco for the fifth time in his career and also became the first driver to win an F1 race wearing a full-face helmet. However, that would be his last podium of the season, as although he led laps early on in Zandvoort, he only finished 7th, then was only 6th in Sherrard. Another 7th place in Silverstone was followed by 4th from the Nürburgring Nordschleife. After failing to reach the chequered flag in Monza and Mossport, Hill's season came to an early end at a track he'd previously had such a good record at. On lap 88 of the 108 lap race at Watkins Glen, he spun off on a patch of oil and stalled his car. Thus, he unfastened his safety belts, got out of the car and push started it, but upon climbing back in, couldn't do his harnesses back up again without outside assistance. He'd also punctured a tyre in the spin and thus signalled he would come in to change it next time round to his pit garage. However, at the end of the longest straight on the track, the punctured tyre exploded sending his Lotus cartwheeling into the embankment. As his seatbelts were undone, Hill was thrown clear of his car, 1950s style, which broke both his legs on landing. He was admitted to hospital and was asked by team members at his bedside if he would like for them to send a message to his wife on his behalf. He humorously quipped, just tell her that I won't be dancing for two weeks. Two 15-year-old boys witnessed the crash firsthand and said they thought Hill had died because the crash looked unsurvivable. He missed the last race of the season in Mexico due to his injuries, having previously not missed a race since the boycotts of the 1960 Italian Grand Prix, and before that, the 1959 United States Grand Prix at Sebring. Hill's charisma and charm had already made him a celebrity in the UK, but he became a national treasure during his time away. I remember reading a book and seeing a picture of him in a wheelchair on a picket line with nurses holding up signs saying, we deserve fair pay. He put a lot of time and effort into his recovery and was just about ready for the first race of the season in Kyle Army, although he wasn't in peak physical condition by any stretch of the imagination. He'd also been dropped from the Lotus Works team as Colin Chapman thought the 41-year-old was past it. However, he joined Rob Walker's privateer team that Sterling Moss had had success with a decade earlier, a team which ran customer Lotus chassis. He only qualified 19th but soon made his way up to 6th place by race end in a drive that he said was one of his greatest, as he had a very limited range of movement and needed help to even get out of his car at race's end. He qualified 19th again at the second race in Harama, but this time made it up to 4th place by the end of the race. Then, at the circuit he was the most successful driver in history at, at Monaco, he finished 5th. After three successive retirements in Spa, Zandvoort and Sherrard, he took 6th again at Silverstone, then retired on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. He didn't enter the race on the Österreich ring, then at the Monza event, Works Lotus driver and championship leader Jochen Rint was killed in an accident before the Sunday, so all Lotuses withdrew from the weekend, including Hill out of respect. He didn't finish any of the final three races of the season in Canada, the United States and Mexico. His comeback was definitely a struggle, as he had his first podiumless year in nearly a decade. Also, he'd only got his hands on the revolutionary Lotus 72 with a few races left and didn't score any results with it. For 1971, Hill moved to Brabham as they entered a tumultuous period in their history, as their co-founder Jack Brabham had just retired and sold his remaining shares to Ron Toronac, but he struggled to match the achievements from when Brabham was a part of his eponymous team. 
Graham's 1971 saw him score points only once, with fifth place at the Österreich ring, but his 1972 season was slightly better as he scored fifth in Monza and two sixth places at Kyle Army and the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Also during 1972, Hill entered the 24 Hours of Le Mans with the Matra team alongside Henri Pescarolo. They won by 11 laps over another Matra driven by Francois Sever and Howden Ganley, which had been tipped to win because Sever was the golden boy of French motorsport and Matra was a French team. As Hill had now won this race, as well as the Indy 500 six years earlier, and the F1 Championship twice, as well as the Monaco Grand Prix five times, he had now become the only driver to win the triple crown of motorsport. To this day, he still holds that distinction, and with the specialisation and diversification of modern motorsport disciplines, I don't think we'll see anyone equal Hill, apart from maybe Fernando Alonso if he gets lucky at Indy one year. Back to F1 now. When Toronac sold the Brabham team to Bernie Eccleston, who owned it until 1987 and partially contributed to its downfall, a topic I covered in another one of my previous videos, Hill decided to leave. Realising that at the ripe old age of 44, he wouldn't be likely to get a top drive, he decided to create his own team, like a lot of world champions did at that time. Emblazoned with cigarette sponsorship, Embassy Racing with Graham Hill was created, most commonly known as Embassy Hill. He missed the first few rounds of 1973, but even when he got back on track, his shadow chassis was uncompetitive. He only got two top tens, with ninth in Zolder and tenth in Paul Ricard, and as a result, he had his first pointless season since 1960. 1974 was remotely better for Hill's team, as they ran a second chassis alongside the one driven by the two-time champion, driven by Guy Edwards, Peter Geffen and Rolf Stommelen. Hill scored six top ten finishes, including a sixth place in Anderstorp, which was his first points finish in almost two years. However, 1975 was a tumultuous season for both Graham and his team, as after 10th in Argentina and 12th in Interlagos, he failed to qualify at Kyle Army. This was the first time he failed to qualify in his F1 career. He handed his car over to Francois Migo at the Spanish Grand Prix at Montjuic Park, presumably for financial reasons, but that race was overshadowed by his other driver, Rolf Stommelen, crashing out while he was leading, which led to the death of four spectators. Then at Monaco, the race Hill had won at five times previously and acquired the nickname of Mr Monaco, he failed to qualify. Upon this, realising he was no longer as good as he had previously been, he decided to call it quits and retire from Formula 1, aged 46, in order to focus on managing his own team. His protégé that took his place, Tony Brise, finished 6th in Sweden, a result which ironically matched Hill's final ever point scoring performance in Formula 1, then future world champion Alan Jones finished 5th driving a Hill chassis on the Nürburgring Nordschleife. The team aimed to continue going into 1976, and the development of the GH2 chassis was underway. However, when Hill was flying some of the team members back from a test session in Paul Ricard in late November, he attempted to land the plane in extremely tricky conditions and promptly crashed into trees on approach to Elstree Airfield. Everyone on board was killed in the crash, and since the team had only three members left, all of which who weren't on the plane obviously, the team had to shut down. Some of the assets were sold to Walter Wolf Racing, but that was probably to pay off the massive costs that were involved with Graham's death. The massive costs came because Hill had been flying unregistered, with expired insurance and the family fortune was thus taken away from his widow Betty and three children. This meant that his son Damon didn't have the easiest way into motorsport with a world champion for a dad, having to work his way up the junior formulas with his own backing and hard work. In 1996, the Hill family became the first to have a father-son duo win the championship, and most documentaries and TV shows about Graham nowadays interviewed Damon at least in some parts to get an insight into his life. Graham was a charismatic and energetic man, typical of the era, and he released two autobiographies, one of which was published posthumously in 1976. He was involved in road safety campaigns too, and also appeared in episodes of Monty Python and in several films. He was an icon of early British sport in the 1960s and 70s, and it's a shame that he passed away so soon. He had the most race starts in F1 history until Jacques Lafitte broke that record in the 80s, and had the longest career in terms of time span until Rubens Barrichello and Michael Schumacher came along in the early 2010s. Not bad for someone who hadn't even got a driving license at the same age that Schumacher was about to win his first F1 title. 
His record of Monaco wins stood until Ayrton Senna broke it in 1993, and as I mentioned earlier, he's still the only man to win the Triple Crown of Motorsport. He's criminally underrated, as most people only think of the likes of Clark, Stewart, or Brabham from his era. I mean, those guys deserve to be mentioned, but so does Hill. He goes into my top 10 Grand Prix drivers of all time, alongside the likes of Fangio, Nuvolari, and Hamilton, and is a true legend of motorsport who was taken from us too soon. Some people say he was never the same driver after he broke his legs in Watkins Glen in 1969. However, I don't think he'd lost all of his talent by that point. He definitely lost some, but I don't think he'd lost all of his talent. I mean, the win at Le Mans proves that he was still a very, very good driver well after that accident. But I think that what happened was that he just got old. He was the oldest driver on the grid for a long time. We haven't had an older driver in F1 since 1975 when Hill retired. So I think it's easy to say that after about 1972 or 1973, you could attribute all of his bad results or all of his mediocre results to old age. Anyways, with that opinion, and with all that being said, I think that brings today's longer biography style video to a close. I hope you enjoyed me detailing the career of Graham Hill, and if you did, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe in order to see more content from me in the future. Big shout out to my Patreon subscribers, Andy Lamberts and Ayman Al Dowdy, for their continued support, and if you'd like to get videos early, along with other perks, or just support the channel, you can subscribe to my Patreon for as little as $1 per month. You can also follow my Instagram, with links in the description. However, without further ado, I'm Nedzo, and I'll see you all later. Bye!